I, am I supposed to start? <laughs> okay, sorry. I apologize. Um, so today we are hearing from the Lieutenant Governor. Um, I guess I should introduce myself really quick first. My name is Felicity Therese Kruger. Um, I'm 18. I'm with COSAR based at Youth Ambassadors and we are hearing from the awesome Lieutenant Governor. Um, I'm so excited to hear from her. She has definitely worked with and been around some of the things that have been really passionate for me being an adoptive parent um, and I'm very inspired by her because of how she turned this passion that she has into a full-time profession um, so yes um, and she's an adoptive parent and I'm adopted so that makes me really warm to see that coming from her um, can't wait to hear all about her journey and hear all the answers that she has to all these questions um, and hear how she supports you um, so I'll start off with my question, um, and then give it to Terry after that. But my question is, um, how are you planning or have planned, um, to support youth in rural communities? Oh, goodness. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, and, and second, let me say that I never promise to have all of the answers to the questions Terry asks me, but I'll do the best that I can. Um, but yeah, so supporting youth in our communities, um, I would say that it, that is um, a thread in the fabric of everything that, that I do, that we do here. Um, I, I'm always looking at the challenges that we face in Kentucky through a, um, a teacher's lens. And I see the, the kids in my classroom and I think about their families and that's how I see uh, both the, the largest challenges that we face, but also the greatest opportunities in front of us. Um, we truly are, are building and um, trying, to, trying to fix things and uh, you know, create the best opportunities that we can, not, not for us, but for the next generation. And so that is, that's a lens through which I do everything. Thank you, Terry. Hey, thanks, Felicity, for being there, and uh, we appreciate uh, you and all those other folks in Adair County joining us today. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, you know we always appreciate you uh, being part of our uh, effort. Uh, when we were putting together Children's Advocacy Week, we have about uh, 25 events and uh, a bunch of interviews, and we're trying to spread those around. So I just have to tell you that when, when the lineup got up there, everybody's like, oh, well, we know who you're going to take. And I was like, you're darn right. I'm taking <laughs> the Lieutenant Governor because I love talking to her. Um, you know, this is for our uh, for our viewers. This is Children's Advocacy Week. We hope that you were part of the rally today. If not, that's on our website. And you can hear uh, Governor Bashir. You can hear Senate and House leadership uh, come together and talk about what's going to happen in the 2022 session. Uh, among the many, many reasons that I so admire the Lieutenant Governor uh, is the first time I ever actually met her was a late afternoon at Children's Advocacy Day a couple years ago. And uh, I say this delicately, but, but the Lieutenant Governor was really pregnant. Like, very pregnant. <laughs> could she get to the second floor? And what I appreciated about that particular event was that uh, I believe I've got this right. Her husband and a couple sons were in a basketball tournament and the event she came to was totally off the radar. There, there wasn't any big crowd. We weren't televising it, telecasting it. We didn't do a press conference. It was for uh, a group of young people who were aging out of foster care. And Lieutenant Governor, I watched you uh, work that room, not for votes, but because you cared. And right then and right there, I knew uh, what a great kid person you were. So uh, I, just wanna, I just want our viewers to know that while this is a public event, uh, you also are a, a kid person in the most private of moments. And uh, that means a whole lot to me. Thank you. Well, that means a lot, Terry. And, and I know you know this, but the work that you all do, not just with children at Children's Advocacy Week, although that's probably the most visual um, event that you all do. I mean, of all, of all people who can bring folks together and, and keep kids at the center, it's you and it's KYA, and I'm, I'm forever grateful for that. So our theme this morning, Lieutenant Governor, 
was uh, we, we talked to folks about what we called imagining unborn tomorrows for Kentucky's kids. Uh, so kind of ran down my list. And, and one of the things that, uh, that the governor picked up on was uh, one of my unborn tomorrows was, uh, could we ever be a state where uh, half the kids didn't show up to kindergarten not prepared to learn? So he did a, a very nice riff on uh, connecting uh, that budget proposal to how we would get there. But you know, I know you have a myriad of notions and visions, and uh, I just really want to kind of give you a, a little bit of a riff time that uh, if you were thinking about your unborn tomorrows for Kentucky's kids, uh, what are two of those, two or three of those things that just jump to your mind? I would definitely say uh, a, a world where uh, pre-K is available and accessible to every four-year-old in Kentucky. And I know the governor talked a lot about that. Um, so I can start there. Um, and that would be the first thing, because to me, that's where it all begins. That's where every unborn tomorrow has the ability to be different for these kids, right? And so... Um, and, I, and I'll, I'll leave with this. I taught high school. Uh, and I taught high school because I was too scared to teach the little kids. <laughs> <laughs> and so for me to say that, that pre-K is, is the key to, to it all for us is, is a big deal. Um, I, you know, I recognize that those kids that come to me behind the eight ball have been behind the eight ball the whole time. Because you pointed out, Terry, that half our kids come to kindergarten, kindergarten ready, right? Well, if you look at the transition readiness rate from senior in high school to whatever's next, it's about the same percentage. And so what that tells us is half the kids are coming to kindergarten, kindergarten ready, and half of our kids are leaving high school transition ready. And that's not a coincidence. Right, because once you begin behind the eight ball, chances are you're gonna, you're gonna stay behind the eight ball. And so when I think about what pre-K can do long-term for our kids, for our families, for our communities, the possibilities are endless. Um, the literacy rates that will improve, which changes everything. And I'm not an English teacher, I was a social studies teacher, but I know that literacy is the foundation of, of everything else that they do. Um, when I think about um, the way that having universal pre-K today will impact our workforce today. And especially with women, because we saw what happened when COVID hit, the people who took the brunt of the hit uh, in the workforce were women. Um, and so to be able to remedy that and to have an answer for that so quickly um, after COVID is going to be astronomical. And you look down the road at, I mentioned literacy rates, um, you have higher rates of high school graduation, of college going rates, of workforce participation rates. And you know what's lower? What's lower is rates of incarceration. What's lower is uh, the rate of dependency upon government programs um, once you get down the road. And so it's an immediate investment that has immediate impact and the long-term effect is just massive for everybody. Um, and then I think a close second would be um, a, a, an unborn tomorrow um, and the potential of it would be um, a, a tomorrow where our kids feel as supported as, as a person as they do as a student in our schools. And so what that means is us learning to teach and cultivate and raise and empower the whole child. So much of that is around social and emotional um, well-being and health. And that's become a huge um, factor. We've been screaming it probably into the void in the world of education and the world of, of uh, you know, kids and their best interests. And it wasn't really until the pandemic hit that people were like, oh yeah, this, this is really important. So now that we've got people's attention, it's time to, it's time to move the ball down the field on that one. And so 
I've actually been working with a group of kids uh, and we're working on uh, their high school students and, and they are leading the work um, on social and emotional and mental health uh, policy that they wanna see changed either through our legislative process, through um, the, the board policy process. And you're gonna see that come to fruition uh, through, throughout this session. And I'm really excited not just for um, these kids to have a voice, these students to have a voice in this process, but the change that can be created um, throughout this generation and for future generations of kids um, is, is going to be really, really impactful, not just for individuals, but for the whole child, for families, um, and on and on and on. So one of the other uh unborn tomorrows that I referenced was an unborn tomorrow where instead of flat out debating and wasting time and money on thinking about uh, armed policemen walking the halls of schools, that we made steps to make investments that really make kids safe, which is exactly what you're talking about social emotional supports. I know the budget that the governor brought forward had a significant commitment to uh, social emotional supports, uh, also deepened uh, Frisky commitment. To me, Frisky's is kind of the vehicle for that. Uh, can, you, can you put a little flesh on this notion? Because when, when folks hear social emotional supports, it's like, uh, what does that mean? So. Not just as lieutenant governor, but my guess is that when you were that assistant principal and before that, when you were a, a teacher, uh, you kind of felt, and as a coach, that you kind of felt what those things meant. Uh, also, for, for our viewers, I want to just emphasize that the lieutenant governor is playing a pivotal role. Uh, one of the things that uh, always makes me scratch my head is that we have a three to one drawdown from the feds in terms of. Uh, every dollar that a district spends, you can get three more dollars for social emotional support. So that's a, a good ROI. And I know you and Commissioner Glass have been working to deepen that. So take us beyond just that idea that we want to have behavioral emotional support. So what's that mean to that fourth grader or eighth grader or 11th grader on a daily basis? Well, so I can give you, I'll, I'll give you a few examples just from, just from my own um wheelhouse from my own perspective um as a teacher and as i as i talk through with these students um, that i've been working with kind of how i can see that come into fruition and so um first and foremost if we want to start treating if we say we want to treat mental health like we do physical health and we should um, then we also have to acknowledge that there's a, there's a disparity in the way that we, um, I don't want to say police that, but monitor that, I guess you could say. So for example, we know students get a certain number of um, excused and unexcused absences at school. They get a certain number of parent notes, so forth and so on. But there's not been a... Um, uh, Kind of a category for absences that allows for mental health things and that goes for teachers too right i mean all school employees and so one of the things i know that has been pretty popular is the notion of what if we started to treat sick days as physically uh sick days or or mental health days right and so that notion is, is out there. I know um, Representative McCool and Representative Wilner have come together to, to uh, work on some legislation about that. And I can tell you the students that I've been working with are thrilled that that has got some traction. Um, I think the way that we talk to students, first, let me start here. Our students are so much more emotionally intelligent than we are, <laughs> so much more. And so the way that we talk to them about mental health and those types of things, the way that we teach them about it has to change, which means our understanding of it has to change. Uh, and I'll say this, I would have been about halfway through my, like today, I would be about halfway through my career in education. I have a bachelor's degree, I have a master's degree, 
and I have a doctorate minus my dissertation because I can't find a way to get that written with a toddler and being with a yeah. doctor, but I'm working on it. So I have, two, you know, essentially two and three quarters degrees, and I've been in the classroom or an, as an assistant principal on the basketball court for 15 years, 12, 15 years, and I have never once been required to take part in professional learning about student mental health. Well, wow. halfway through my profound. career, that's really I, profound, right? But you know what I have to do every year, every single year, I have to take the bloodborne pathogen training that I've never ever used. Thank goodness. But you know, you think about the priorities that we have and what we've mandated that has to happen. And then what's just dangling out there with our hopes and dreams. And you think, if we want to truly teach the whole child, we have to equip our educators with the skills and the resources and, and the knowledge that they need to be able to do that. Because I'm telling you right now, I've learned so much from these high school students through this process uh, that I'm not sure I'd know where to start if I was in the classroom and didn't have some support around, here's how you talk about it. Here's how you support kids that need it. Here are the resources available to them that you need to help make them aware of. I mean, there's so much there. And so, I mean, that's low hanging fruit. Those, those the sick days, the professional learning uh, around this, this idea. And then the one thing we've heard at every single mental health summit, and I'll stop here, is the suicide prevention training updates, or sorry, suicide prevention trainings need to be updated because they are like, they're still on VHS cassettes. That's how old they are. Um, so that's another thing we kept hearing from students. So those are just ways that to me are low hanging fruit that are not controversial. They're not, they're not going to be divisive. Those are things that we can come together to get done. Yeah. I, I bet you also, as a teacher, every year had to go through CPR training. So you had to, you had to learn how to recalibrate the physical part of the heart but not heart as an emotional part. That's a, that's a great. That question. is a great way to say that actually. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and thank goodness I never had to use that either, but I had to do the training every, every couple of years. Yeah. yeah. You know, you mentioned something. I, I want to get to a couple other topics, but, but I always appreciate your perspective on education. Uh, so I am so old and decrepit that I remember uh, that in uh, 1990, leading Republican lawmakers and leading uh, uh, Democratic uh, lawmakers. Uh, turned out that the school at which I was principal right then had the uh, pres Democratic president of the Senate and uh, somebody named Ann Northup, who uh, was a state senator and went on. And it was interesting because those two parents uh, who went to Frankfurt every day were leading voices around the Kentucky Education Reform Act. Uh, they didn't agree on anything but they agreed on authentic assessment, and ungraded primary, and site-based decision-making, some pretty revolutionary notions. So we entered the 90s as a state, uh, really cohesive, a cohesive vision. Uh, there is, I don't know if there is a more toxic arena right now than K-12 education. SROs and critical race theory and local control or not local control, uh, funding. I mean, you just, there's not a whole lot of agreement. So from a, you know, you're a social studies, political science type person. So sort of taking yourself where you're sitting right now, which I know is a little bit hard, but if you were to think about it from a, a more academic perspective, uh, what is it about, uh, K-12 education, because it's not just Kentucky, right? The Virginia governor's race, you could argue, was determined by K-12. That's certainly an issue at the national level. Uh, we're together pretty much on child welfare. Uh, I think we're remarkably close on juvenile justice. Lots of important sectors for kids are common ground. Uh, there's no commonality when it comes to schools. What, what's happened uh, in a civic dialogue on that? Oh, goodness. How long do we have? Um, <laughs> uh, you've got another uh, 38 minutes, uh, 28 minutes. Okay. Um, so let me go back to this. I taught social studies. I'll, go, I'll take this back. I taught 
social studies when I was in the classroom. And there was a time where um, we began to really peel back the focus on social studies and, and science. It was all math and, and literacy in Engl you know, English language arts. And there is, uh, to me, there is no subject area that's more important than the other. They all complement each other. They all come together and serve different purposes in different ways. Um, and as we saw that rollback of social studies, there, I would argue there is a direct connection to the decline in, um, in civic engagement and civic dis civil discourse, it, be it became, now we can't talk about anything that people will disagree with. We, we, have to, we have to put that to the side, we can't argue about anything. And in that notion, we might've avoided uh, you know, immediate conflict but what we didn't do and what we failed to do was teach our students how to analyze, how to think critically, how to look at different sides of an issue and how to have a conversation with someone that you may not agree with and walk away amicably. And boy, did we miss our opportunity when, when that went by the wayside. And so we are now dealing with the fallout from that. And that's what we see in here every single day. Uh, that's on the academic side. On the political side, I think what you've seen is uh, groups of elected officials who have realized that every, one thing we have in common is we all go to the doctor and we've all gone to school. And so that makes us all experts, mm -hmm. medical experts and education experts. Uh, and that's not at all the case. Um, the interesting thing about um, the Virginia governor's race versus what's happening in Kentucky right now is it's the polar opposite. So in Virginia, you have the Democrats who, the Democratic candidate who said, parents don't have any, any place in, I don't remember how he said it, but you know what I mean. Um, parents don't have any place in, in the curriculum. That's just for teachers. And I, you know, across Kentucky, teachers are going, no, we want parents involved. We need parents involved. And now you have um, in Kentucky, the Republican party, is actually removing the power of the site-based decision-making council, which as you mentioned in 1990, is what gave parents a voice in education. And so it's, it doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on, it doesn't matter um, what the topic is, there is consternation there. And it, it is just, people are seething over it. And as I think about it as a teacher, as I think about it as a parent, as I think about it as Lieutenant Governor, right? I'm the highest elected teacher in Kentucky, which is crazy for me to say out loud. But that, that perspective that I have from this seat is no different than the one at the seat at my desk as a teacher. And so I would, I would say that if we take the politics out of all of this, and we have people that say they do, right? They say, well, we don't wanna, we don't wanna talk about politics. We don't wanna, you know, we don't wanna involve, um, you know, controversy and this kind of thing. And, and here's the first thing I would say, and this is, I know you like to talk about leadership too. So this is kind of a leadership, a leadership thing, but if you have to divide to win, you're not a leader, you're an opportunist, first and foremost. And especially if you have to divide at the cost of our kids, then certainly you're not a leader, you're an opportunist. And so here, here are the three things that I always asked when I was in the classroom, when I was a school leader, and now when I'm lieutenant governor, to decide to you know to decipher is this truly what's best for for education? The first is is it does it have a kid first mentality? Period, paragraph, end of discussion. Kids come first, always, always. Even at the even at the um, you know um, I guess inconvenience of of adults. Big deal figure it out, we gotta do what's best for kids, right? Kid first mentality. The second is, does it take care of the people who take care of our kids every day, right? So while the kids come first, the people who take care of our kids every day are an awful close second. Because if we're not taking care of them, then we can't say that our kids' education is important, period. And third, last but not least, the last, um, 
uh, piece of my litmus test is, does it give schools the resources that it needs to do what we've asked them to do? Novel idea, right? We can't keep asking schools to do things that they don't have the resources or the capacity to do. That's not fair, it's not possible. And so if we're willing to put kids first, if we're willing to take care of the people who take care of our kids, and we're willing to give schools the resources they need to do what we've asked them to do, we will succeed like you've never seen. But if we're more focused on dividing and political talking points and fighting culture wars and all of that kind of stuff on the turf of K-12, it'll be, it'll be, it'll continue to not serve anyone, especially not our kids. That's a great policy rubric, isn't it? To to lay on anything coming before the, the General Assembly. So you mentioned leadership. And if uh, if folks internally uh, here said, well, I, we know you're going to take the Lieutenant Governor's interview. And I said, yeah, your, your staff, and they probably told you, they're like, what are you going to ask her? And I'm like, well, I'm going to tell you what, because uh, we, we just talk. They said, but you're going to bring up Pat Summit, aren't you? And I said, yeah, because it's an obligation. So for our listeners who may not know or for our viewers, Pat Summit was a legendary uh, women's basketball coach at University of Tennessee, uh, who I think influenced uh, the Lieutenant Governor. I like it because uh, she won't admit it, but she wears orange whenever the Lady Vols play. So I just, I like that part. So here's a great quote from Pat Summit. Oh, okay. It's what you learn after you know it all that counts the most. And you and I have talked about this before because one of the things that just fascinates me about Jacqueline Coleman is that it wasn't that long ago that you were doing lunchroom supervision about this time of day, uh, yep. maybe yep. four years ago, okay? Maybe just finished. You've just cleaned the cafeteria. So you've gone from cleaning the last table at the high school to sitting where you're sitting. What did you think you knew that as you look back, man, you didn't have a clue about. So what have you been learning up there? Oh man, that is a great question. Uh, any any Pat Summit quote is great. I always kept, I, I kept her definite dozen in my locker room when I was coaching. And then I keep it with me in, in my office as well, because it's, yeah. it, it's, it's great for life. Um, but first of all, I never thought I knew it all. Um, I think that's the difference is in teachers, you, you understand the importance of, become, of being a lifelong learner. And so I really do try to keep my mind open to um, ideas that are different than mine. And even if at the end of the day, I'm not moved, my, like I'm not moved to change my mind, I at least like to know where the other person is coming from, right? And so it's never about trying to convince someone to believe what I believe or, or being convinced. Um, it's more about listening to understand. And um, I, I knew that was important, but what I probably didn't realize was how critically important it was going to be to elevate student voices at this level. Um, I always thought of student voice as like, student voice in the classroom and what, way, what ways do you learn best? And you know, those types of things. But I'm getting ready to take a group of students who are high schoolers to um, present to legislative committees and to the state board of education on mental health um, and how we can help with policies and moving policies forward. And I don't know that I ever, ever imagined that that was going to become a reality at this level. And um, I, I'm just very grateful that we have other leaders you know, Commissioner Glass is all about student voice. Um, Representative McCool, who is not from the same party I'm from, has said to me on multiple occasions, hey, I want to meet with those students. I want to talk to them. I want them to look at my bill because I want it to be as good as it can be. Right. So now we have adults who are actually, you know, operationalizing this notion of student voice that we all spoke about. It's becoming reality now. It's becoming part of our our process. And so I think when I, when I first started talking about student voice, it was very limited. And I, and maybe that's because I was limited in where I was and what I could do at the time. But to see it 
grow and come to fruition the way that it has in us to put kids right at the center and hear them uh, has been one of the most rewarding things that I never expected. That's great. That's a great. And I just, you know, say amen to that, Maggie. Uh, Felicity mentioned that, uh, and she's part of our group of young people who uh, give voice around abuse and neglect. Uh, so impressed with another group of young people we have who are targeting uh, or targeted a couple of years ago, Baby. Uh, got another group of young people who uh, are alums of the child welfare system. So that youth voice is so important. Uh, Felicity mentioned uh, your role uh, as an adoptive mom. And when we think about child welfare, uh, what I do love about child welfare uh, in stark contrast to K-12 is that does not seem to be a partisan issue. Uh, very candidly, Bashir 1.0 administration, the Bevan administration, Andy Bashir's administration, they may not like it, but they're all pointing in the same direction. Uh, we see real honoring of foster parents. We see, see real honoring of kinship families. We know transitioning out of care is tough. Uh, we know Kentucky is still struggling with leading the nation in abuse and neglect. So when you think about that child welfare arena that covers such a, a wide area, uh, you kind of... Uh, Seems like you've worked yourself into sort of like you're an ambassador without portfolio. You kind of get to angle on this issue and that issue. Uh, what are the kind of things on child welfare that are animating your brain right now, either as that adoptive mom or lieutenant governor or looking at broader sectors? Uh, what's, what's Jacqueline Coleman's drumbeat right now on child welfare? You know, I, I just don't know. I don't know that there is a more important um, issue. I don't know that there's a more important thing for us to talk about or to or to work towards um, than that. I, I cannot tell you how much it absolutely breaks my heart to know that Kentucky continually leads in in this uh, in this arena of child abuse and neglect and, and our kids in foster care. Um, I was a foster care um, advocate from the time I was in second grade. It's hilarious, right? Um, and it's because a teacher exposed me to it. If really? we, for, for those millennials out there that remember weekly readers in second grade, um, I had a teacher who gave us a weekly reader article on yeah. um, the adoption system in, in China. And wow. it was that moment that I, I thought, wait a minute, so there, there are kids out there that don't have parents? well, then why are we not taking care of them? That was the first question I asked. And so I've always had that mindset of we got to take care of kids that are here. Um, and so it that's just always been on my heart. It's been part of who I am. I actually, as Felicity mentioned, I adopted one of my basketball players um, who needed a place to go. And she is, um, I just got off the phone with her before I got on with you. She's in Albania playing professional basketball now. Wow. Uh, which is wild. And you think about the trajectory of that child's life and the way that it changed because she had people around her who loved her and cared about her and, and loved her enough to discipline and, and to hold her accountable and to expect more. Her life changed. And, and now her family's life will change and her children's life will change and so forth and so on. And it really is that mentality that we have to have. We cannot um, fix a system that that has has uh, created this type of, of um, atmosphere in Kentucky overnight, but we can go you know one child at a time, one life at a time, and to me that is what is important, and that is what I have so much respect for. Some of these um, legislators that that are also adoptive parents that are on a different side of the aisle than me. That's what we talk about whenever I'm with them, and that's what brings us together. And we have a a um, we have an obligation um, to those kids to, to help them and to make, help make their lives better and to give them every opportunity that we can. And that is um, everything from health um, and make sure they have access to health care, to make sure that we have wraparound services in our schools that can help support these students and get them to where they need to be. 
um, and on and on. Um, and that's again where the social and emotional well-being and mental health comes into play, right? There's so many ways we can um, address these really difficult situations and subjects. We gotta, we just gotta start by putting one foot in front of the other and build on it and build on it and build on it. We can always keep moving forward that way, in my opinion. Um, but I'm not sure there's a more important thing for us to talk about. So I'm gonna give you a, a, a setup question because I think it's uh, something that you, uh, the governor and Secretary Friedlander would agree with. Uh, I wanna direct our, our viewers, uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, uh, I would, would suggest you look at a, a, a breaking investigation from the Center for Investigative Reporting. Uh, and it, uh, they just released an analysis of where Kentucky stands on uh, child fatalities and near fatalities due to abuse and neglect. Uh, pretty ugly picture, 80% uh, increase. Uh, we continue to lead the nation. Uh, our hypothesis that we suggested is that unless and until we attend to frontline workers, uh, unless and until we think about uh, those frontline DCBS workers, recruitment, retention, work conditions, uh, we simply are not going to be able to uh, solve the, the tragedy of kids dying from abuse and neglect. So I know that, that the governor's budget and some other efforts that CHFS are making uh, is around that idea that when you're talking about helping frontline workers, you're really talking about helping kids. Want to riff a little bit on that? Uh, try to, to maybe channel uh, when our viewers are talking to their senator and their representative, uh, what points should they be making on that? And, and that's so that's so important and it's and it's so true. And I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna go back to my litmus test for education because it's gonna be the same exact questions that I would ask in this scenario, right? So if we're looking at policy um, uh, legislation of any kind that deals with abuse and neglect, right? Does it put our kids first? Does it take care of the people who take care of our kids? And, and you have to change a word here, but are we giving um, our frontline workers the resources they need to do what we've asked them to do, right? I mean, this is not, I've said nothing here that's earth shattering, right? But if we've got to put our kids first, we've got to be willing to take uh, care of the people who take care of our kids. Um, and in this case, that would be social workers and frontline workers. And I have to tell you that they do some of the most difficult jobs and I don't know how they do them. I really don't. They, they are, they're, I know education is a calling and social work is a calling and, and all of those types of things, but man, um, thank God for them because I, I don't know that I could do it. I don't know that I could do it. And at the, at the very least, we should be giving them the resources that they need to take care of our kids. Because if, if we're leading the nation and we are in, in child abuse and neglect, um, then the investment that we're, that we should be willing to make in making sure that's not a reality should match, um, the, the alarm bells that go off when you say that out loud. So let me ask you this question. The governor, uh, today, as well as speaker Osborne, uh, spent a good time at the rally and it was really good because they both got into substantive discussions about their their budgets uh, do you is there an element of the governor's budget that you think is really important for kids that's not getting a lot of play so you, you know what's grabbed the headlines and where the points of contention are uh, my guess is that uh, and I don't know this but that as y'all are elbowing and putting that budget together, there are certain things that you're just like, got to be in, got to be in. Uh, what, what are a couple core issues that maybe our listeners haven't heard about or thought about that you think when you dig into that budget, it's really important that they are advocating for? Great question. I know you've probably heard most about, um, in our budget at least, uh, the investment in pre-K. I know that's gotten a lot, um, probably a lot of news about uh, the social and emotional 
uh, supports. One of the things that um, I'm not so sure has gotten a lot of play probably outside of the school system is the funding for transportation. That's not, that's something that is, you kind of have to live it to understand it in a, in a way, but just to give folks a little bit of a background, transportation has only been funded at about 60%. And so for a long time, superintendents have said, listen, if you can fund transportation at 100%, um, then we can take that money and we can put it towards full day kindergarten or preschool, right? Well, not only did the governor include in his budget 100% of transportation funding, he also included pre-K. So what that's going to do, that's going to free up dollars to do exactly what you started out talking about by investing the, that federal match of three to one, or one to three, I guess you could say. Um, that's going to free up dollars to be able to do things like hire mental health clinicians or um, invest in other areas of the whole child that uh, schools would have been you know, dying to be able to do, but just couldn't afford it. Um, and so when we fund transportation at 100%, that's massive period, at, you know, like end of discussion. That's huge. But what funding transportation does to free up dollars for all kinds of other areas and schools is it, it, it just is going to have this ripple effect like you wouldn't believe. Um, and so the impact that we're going to be able to have by freeing up those dollars for schools, aside from just paying for, you know, this is back to the resources question, right? Do we just want them to transport 60% of our kids to school? Is that good enough? No? Okay, well then we need to fund transportation at 100%, right? And so doing that is gonna free up so many resources for kids, it, our kids that are most in need, right? Um, and so that's something that, it's a little bit of playing the long game, but that investment in turn is going to free up lots of things that that your supporters and your folks in your arena are going to are going to want available for our kids at our schools. So, because really, right now, if I'm especially if I'm a small smaller rural school, oh yeah, the reason I don't have that teacher assistant that I need, or the reason we don't have that physics teacher, because we really have kids who deserve physics but we can't afford it, is because I'm spending that physics teacher money on transportation, right? Oh, bingo. Yeah, okay, great. So it was not, uh, I wish we could say that we uh, had done this in response, but we'd already planned it. And the, the three folks, among the folks we featured uh, this morning at the rally uh, was a young person from Warren County, a young person from McCracken County, and our community champion uh, is a uh, childcare leader uh, from Marshall County. So all of those folks just ravage uh, from, uh, from the tornadoes. Uh, I don't think we can have many events this week uh, without asking folks we're talking to, especially folks like you who have been on the ground, to just share some reflections, really not just about Children's Advocacy Week, but just that whole gestalt uh, you know, I saw you down there frequently. Uh, I think you're even going maybe this week. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, just can you bring folks who have not been there uh, uh, just a little reality as to what you're seeing, uh, what we should all be thinking and praying for when we think about Western Kentucky? Yes, and I, I appreciate you bringing that up because it really is hard to, it's hard to wrap your mind around. I uh, made several visits out there, but also so did the governor and have planned to go back every, you know, 30 days um, to, to check in and make sure that folks are getting what they need and to let them know that they've not been forgotten. Because as I continued to say, um, while we were down there is this, the, the, the rebuilding is gonna far outlast the news cycle. And um, we want people to, to know that we're still with them and we're, we're, we're hanging with them the whole way. And a lot of these schools went, or a lot of these um, areas went back to school this week. Um, I can tell you this, that, that being there on the ground, 
it's hard it's hard to describe even you have to see it to believe it but even when you see it it's hard to put it into words but i can say that i think the only thing that that rivaled the devastation that i saw in these areas was the humanity that we saw out of neighbors helping neighbors it was just i mean i'm standing in the middle of a back road in taylor county and there are these trucks that are pulling up like work trucks that are pulling up with all this equipment on the back and they get out of the truck and i hear them say to the people whose house we're sitting in front of they introduce themselves they say i'm so and so from so you know whatever county what do you need i've got this and this and this what can i do they have no idea who these people are right and they're showing up and just asking where they can get started to help and you know, that was heartwarming enough. I was in Bremen in uh, Muhlenberg County, and it was the, I mean, it was 12 hours after the, the tornadoes passed. And I'm walking through an elementary school gym that is packed, packed with coats and shoes and baby formula and diapers and blankets and I mean, it's tables among tables that are stacked, that are underneath, that are on the stage. And I walk through and on the way back out, it, it dawned on me that they didn't, this stuff didn't come in from, from other places. And it's only been 12 hours. This came from people within that community that were fortunate enough to not get hit, right? And so they're bringing stuff in to help their neighbors. And that really, that really hit me. Um, I will say that there was a, a farmer that I met his wife. I did not get a chance to meet him, but the governor did invite him to the state of the Commonwealth address because his story was so moving. He's a bus driver uh, at, at the local school and the storm passed, their neighbors call and say, are you okay? And they're like, well, our, our roof is, is, you know, got holes in it and our house is leaking, but we're, we're okay. And the neighbor says, well, we're in the basement, but our house has fallen in. They literally go down the road and start physically moving pieces of the house and they pull their neighbors out. I mean, these are just everyday heroes that there were no camera, like you said, there's no cameras around. There's nobody doing it. You know, they literally were saving people's lives. And, and I remember the farmer telling me, his name was Nevin. He, he said, um, I could hear them say, we're down here, don't leave us. Hmm. And you think about, I'm sure in that moment, just the, the, the human element of that is just get down to the bottom and, and, and help these people get out. But that's haunting. That's very haunting thing for, for these folks to continue to live with and, and the people that they saved and, and unfortunately people that they couldn't, um, that's gonna stay with them. And that's why I think it's, in, it's important to remember that rebuilding buildings are important, rebuilding communities are important and we're gonna be there for that. We've got to rebuild people's lives too. And that's gonna take a very long-term um, investment for the impact that we need that we're not gonna be able to physically see like we would a building going back up. Right, um, but I, I tell you, everywhere I looked, it was neighbors helping neighbors and stories just like that. And I think one of the most important things I took from this is when you talk about leadership and the divisiveness of certain issues and especially in politics and things like that, not a single person, not one single time did I hear the word Republican, Democrat, conservative, or liberal. Not once. I was meeting with locally elected officials who I recognized, but I didn't know what party they belonged to and I didn't care. And they didn't care about mine either. What they needed was this, this, and this. And our job is to help them get that, right? And so, it, you know, in our, in our darkest moments, when we think about rebuilding after a tornado, or you mentioned, for instance, like the SROs in, uh, you know, we always talk about after school shootings, right? 
wouldn't it be nice if we could address the challenges that we face with the mentality, with like a post-disaster mentality rather than a, a, a political one where we try to get, gain something? I mean, the conversations we should be having about um, school safety should be the same ones we have after a tragedy happens and we think, how can we go in and help these folks? Those are the answers, not all this other stuff, right? When we talk about helping folks rebuild their lives after a tornado devastates an entire community, those are the answers. Those are the things we should be working on every single day, uh, not just after tragedy strikes. And so, um, sorry, I went full circle on that all no. the way to safety, no, but, that's, but that's the mentality we should have um, as leaders. That's great. So uh, final question uh, as we go out, uh, you know, I, I tend to think that uh, for many folks who watch these events or who attend our re virtual rally or, or watching this, uh, the idea of approaching uh, a Jacqueline Coleman or their state representative or their state senator, they, they know they should do it. They don't need, I don't mean this at you, they don't need the rhetoric of reach out, make your voice heard. They, they get that, or they wouldn't be on this kind of a broadcast. They're looking for, uh, using, I guess, the, uh, the coach vernacular, they're looking for the playbook, okay? They, they wanna, uh, they, they may need a tip or two as to how to do it. So when they're getting ready to talk to their state senator on that issue, or their state representative on this issue, what can you tell them? Like what works for you? And maybe that'll work on this senator or representative. So, so what are some tips on influencing, whether it's the executive branch or the legislative branch that you'd like to, to give to uh, folks tuning in today? That's a great question. I, I would say two things. One, I would um, make sure that you have data to back up your um, your cause and your passion because you can be as passionate as you want about something um, but if, if you um, don't bring the data and the facts that are needed um, it's it, it's just going to be a passion of yours right um, and we want it to become more than that and the second thing is beyond those numbers and facts and figures that you that you have um, carry with you people's stories because people's stories are, um, are the way that you can connect with um, your elected officials, with uh, people in other organizations. You know, that is truly what carries this, um, this passion forward. And so it, it really is, I think, a matter of being able to be a good storyteller and to be able to back up what you want, um, what you want to happen with um, data and facts and figures, because those are kind of hard to argue with. <laughs> right. Lieutenant Governor, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, you know, when I think about unborn tomorrows for Kentucky's kids, among the best shots we have in making those into today's reality is you oh. and your perception and your leadership. So I so appreciate uh, both your heart and your brain uh, have a great rest of the day and thanks for taking time uh, to join us today. Thank you so much, Terry. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye bye.